draw your attention to right before we get going. The Department of Entomology at the University of Maryland now has an online master's program. So I have um, some information if you're interested. It's an online master's program in integrated pest management and applied entomology. So there's, these flyers are out there on the desk where you signed in. Also inside your packets, you should have a very long fact sheet about spotted wing drosophila that has some really good images that will help. Some of these images are in my talk today. But I wanna, really want to draw your attention to is I have made spray tables with some of what we think are the more effective products or how effective we think they are for these different fruit crops that are susceptible to spotted wing drosophila. So this can be a help, help you out um, when you're making your management decisions. And there's also some information in there about how to monitor for spotted wing drosophila. So I'm going to gloss over that a little bit today in my talk. So first I'm going to go over a little bit about spotted wing drosophila damage and detection. But again, most of that is in this fact sheet as are some of the pre-harvest harvest management tactics. So I'm going to move through that pretty quickly. We'll talk a little bit about post-harvest management. And then I will talk about scarab beetles and blueberries and brambles. So spotted wing drosophila is a little fruit fly, very similar to the fruit flies you would see over your fruit bowl in your house. So these are small amber flies. Unfortunately, this species likes ripe and ripening fruit, fruit so it lays the egg directly into fresh fruit. The, they're called spotted wing drosophila because the males have these spots on the end of their wings. The females do not have spots and they're quite difficult to identify unless you look at them under magnification. In terms of what their damage looks like, so we first start to see them in Maryland at the tail end of the cherry season. So a lot of times actually what I'll see is after you've finished harvesting the, the cherries that are still on the tree, that's where you start to see them. They make these little stings where they cut a hole and put their egg in. So you'll see these little divots in the fruit and the fruit start to rot afterwards. If you open that fruit up, you'll see this little larva inside. They're about the size of a grain of rice. They're pointed on both ends. In terms of blueberries, there is a divot there where they cut the hole. You typically don't see this until after you've taken it off the, the plant and it's desiccated a little bit. So it, this, it shrivels up a little bit, then you see that divot. And you can find the larvae inside the fruit. For blackberries, it be, can be challenging to see a divot. It can also be challenging to find the larva. But what you'll notice is that the fruit is really leaky. It's softer. It will mold faster. You'll see a lot of juice coming out of it. That's typically a sign that you have spotted wing drosophila in that fruit. Same thing for raspberries. The fruit gets softer. So when you pull this off, if you look in the cap, you'll see this little droplet of water, a little droplet of juice. Sometimes you'll see that larva swimming around in there. So that's typically how you see it. And again, you can find the larvae in the fruit, but sometimes you don't see them as much as you might think. Um, so in terms of spotted wing drosophila monitoring, as I mentioned, it's in the fact sheet. I recommend looking for larvae. Unfortunately, you already have larvae in your fruit at that point, but trying to monitor for adults is pretty difficult. You catch a, lo a lot of other insects, um, and you don't really catch it with enough lead time to start making management decisions anyway. So you want to start worrying about this pest when your fruit is starting to pink up right before it becomes ripe. That's when they begin to be susceptible. In terms for different management strategies that you can use, we do have some chemical control strategies. And as I mentioned, I have spray tables in that fact sheet. Problem with the insecticides is they only target the adults. So if you already have larvae in your fruit, a few days later, those larvae are going to develop all the way to adults, and you'll have adults again. Um, so this ends up meaning that you have to, it seems like your sprays aren't working. In terms of spraying, it does end up that you have to spray pretty frequently. Uh, we want to avoid insecticide resistance. So to avoid insecticide resistance, you want to use different activity groups. So these are some of the activity groups that work. And again, I have them split out by activity group in the spray tables um, and by which products we think are more effective than others. So try to pick something from the different activity groups each time you're doing that so that we can delay the development of insecticide resistance. Some other things to think about with insecticides. The majority of the insecticides we use for spotted wing drosophila are not very rain fast. So this is some work coming out of Michigan. Less than an inch of rain a day after application. Most of the efficacy is lost for these products. Mustang Max has a little bit better 
um, rain fastness, but most of these products are just washing right off. So you're not gonna see much residual activity if it rains. The other thing you wanna think about is especially with brambles, you have a lot of foliage covering up the fruit. You really have to get good spray coverage and get that product on the fruit. Just to give you a perspective, California commercial raspberries typically recommend 100 to 200 gallons of carrier water per acre. It's a lot of coverage. In North Carolina commercial brambles, we're seeing more like 30 to 50. The more carrier water you can use when you're making these applications, the better coverage you can get, the more effective this, these applications are gonna be. Otherwise, you're really just wasting your time trying to make these applications. So keep that in the back of your mind. Think about rain, think about coverage when you're making these sprays and rotate modes of action. The other thing that I wanna remind you about insecticides is they are broad spectrum insecticides, the ones that we're suggesting for spotwing Drosophila. We have started to see some secondary pest issues in some regions, flaring of mites, scales, white flies, because we're killing off the natural enemies, and you're getting these secondary pest problems. So keep an eye out for these types of issues. I'm gonna take a moment to talk about some of the new labeling on insecticides in regards to pollinators at this point. So insecticides are harmful for pollinators. Um, some of them can kill pollinators on direct contact with the, with the pollinators. Pollin many of these pollinators are insects. These are insecticides. It's not really a surprise. The EPA has tried to do, make some changes to insecticide labels to help reduce pollinators coming in direct contact with insecticides. This is not new. So this is just to give you an idea. Pesticide labels are federal law. So it's against federal law to, to use an insecticide in a manner that is inconsistent with its labeling. And they've always had, under the environmental hazards, this product is highly toxic to bees exposed to direct treatment or residues on blooming crops or weeds. So this has always been on insecticide labels. So I know a lot of you are hearing this new language. It's not that new. We've always had some language about pollinators on insecticide labels. What is new is this pollinator protection box. So now you're gonna see the little bee in his red diamond. And this is, so far this label has been rolled out on four of the foliar neonic insecticides and some of the newer group 28 diamide insecticides. In terms of trying to interpret what that language looks like, I'm gonna to try to lead you through it a little bit. The first thing to note is see individual crops for specific pollinator protection application restrictions. So the first thing you wanna do, move forward on that label to what crop you're going to be applying to. So for this example, if you're going to be applying to strawberries, write in the application box that says do not apply during bloom or within 10 days prior to bloom or when bees are foraging. So that's the, the requirement that you have to follow. If you move to a crop that has nothing about pollinators underneath it, then you go back to that pollinator protection box and you look, if so, I'm, I've skipped the part where if you're paying someone to pollinate your crop, that's got separate regulations. If you're not paying someone to, to pollinate your crop, then for foliar applications, you have to follow these directions. And that's for food crops that are commercially grown and commercially grown ornamentals that are attractive to pollinators. What does that mean, attractive to pollinators? Pesticide companies are hoping, well, the, the, sorry, the EPA is hoping the pesticide companies are gonna tell you whether a crop is attractive to pollinators or not. They're not gonna tell you. So Maryland will eventually make a list of what crops they believe are attractive to pollinators, but until that list comes out, you should be pretty careful, and I'll go through some of the things that, how I would interpret that label. So the first thing, do not apply this product while bees are foraging. If you see a bee in your crop while you have your spray rig, bees are foraging. And that's what I would use to determine whether your crop is attractive to pollinators. Do you see bees in your crop at that moment? It's attractive to pollinators. So the next part of that is do not apply this product until flowering is complete and all petals have fallen. What does it mean all petals have fallen? There are some crops that are indeterminate and you're gonna have flowers on there all year round. That means they, for those crops, if the bees have stopped foraging, all pellet, they consider that to be all petals have fallen. So again, back, do you see bees in your crop? Don't spray. 
unless one of the following conditions is met. So here's some of the different conditions you can have. The first is the application is made to the target site after sunset. The second is the application is made to target site when temperatures are below 55 degrees Fahrenheit. What this means is that for the entire duration of your spray, it has to be below 55 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you start in the morning and it warms up at the end of your spray, you're in violation. If you start after sun, just before sunrise and then the sun comes up, you're in violation. So it has to be for the entire duration of your spray. This next part is the, the third section is not really going to be relevant to you guys. So I'm going to go over this very last condition. The application is made due to an imminent threat of significant crop loss and a documented determination consistent with an IPM program. What does that mean? You have to consult with a cooperative extension agent, crop consultant, certified crop advisor, or state rec recognized pest management specialist or model, model or tool, and then meet some criteria that imminent crop threat of crop loss is going to happen and document it. So you need to record that. So that is the last condition in terms of uh, spraying with these new bee labels. And as each of these different products goes back through registration, you can see this bee box is going to be coming up on those products as well. Just something to be aware of. Yes? All bees. It's supposed to be all pollinators. Mm -hmm. And if you're paying somebody to bring in honeybees, there's the, the rules are slightly different in terms of w notifying beekeepers and things like that. Um, but I assume that most of you were not paying someone for pollination services. OK. In terms of some other ways to manage spotted wing drosophila, there are some cultural control tactics. In terms of their activity in Maryland, I've monitored in a lot of different crops over the year. We really start to see peaks after early July. So any crop that is fruiting with ripe fruit from early August till frost has the highest risk for damage from spotted wing drosophila. So the first thing you can do if you're putting in new plantings, you think, are thinking about growing brambles, plant early ripening varieties or early to mid-season. If you can avoid that period of highest risk, you have a lot better chance of managing this pest. The next thing you can think about is sanitation. A lot of you are growing different types of varieties, different types of fruit. You have a lot of on-farm sources for spotted wing drosophila. So for instance, you have a cherry block. You're done harvesting. You've moved on to harvesting blueberries. You have some cherry fruit still at the top of your tree. You haven't sprayed at them. You haven't looked at them. They can potentially be full of spotted wing drosophila and you don't know it. And it's just building a population right there on your farm. Another place I really see this happen, excuse me, fall bearing raspberries. You pruned them to the ground. Maybe a few of those canes were a little long. You have some early season flora cane fruit. You're not in there harvesting. You're not worried about that crop. You're not doing anything to manage them. They could be potentially full of spotted wing drosophila. So what you really want to do is remove and destroy your cold fruit, your pre and post harvest fruit as much as possible, and harvest as frequently as possible to help keep down the on-farm population of spotted wing drosophila once those populations are starting to build up. How do you destroy the fruit? <laughs> Uh, composting may not be enough. You can't just throw it in a pile. The flies will still emerge from the, that pile of fruit. So you need to bury it at least two feet deep, freeze it, heat it, or throw it away off your farm in terms of destroying it. Some other things that we're thinking about in terms of cultural control tactics. Exclusion is one thing that people have been thinking about. We do have a, f um, a federal grant it's a multi-state project around the United States to start looking at some alternate control strategies. One of the things that some groups are looking at is exclusion. So using a really fine mesh netting, being really careful going in to those tunnels after you've netted them to try to keep spotted wing drosophila out. So there's going to be some research as to whether this is feasible and economic. We think blueberries, where everything is pollinated all at once, it's going to be probably a better application for this technology than maybe some of these other ones. But we're doing the research in raspberries as well to see what will happen in terms of quality of fruit. 
Another thing that we're looking into in the system studies I'm going to be doing right, right out here in the Y, uh, as well as at Kittiesville, is habitat manipulation. So we're looking to see whether pruning or mulching can impact spotwing drosophila populations in terms of opening up the canopy or using some of these mulches, these black plastic mulches underneath the plants. Um, why would we think that that might make a difference? So Hannah Barak's lab in North Carolina has been looking at where spotwing drosophila tend to infest the fruit within the canopy. So if you can imagine, this is a blackberry planting. This, this whole triangle is the canopy. So you have the lower edge fruit, so the fruit down on the ground, fruit kind of middle in the middle, and then you have the fruit that's inside that trellis, the fruit that's in the inner part of the canopy. She sampled this from August to October at two sites. One site that used insecticides more heavily and one site that wasn't really using insecticides. So this is the site where they weren't really using insecticides and this is the number of larvae per berry. You can see that there were more spotted wing drosophila larvae in those fruit that were in the inner part of the canopy. This was also true where people were where in the site where they were using insecticides. So you might think that fruit on the inner part of the canopy has a much more poor spray coverage, which is true. But even at the site where they weren't spraying as heavily, you're seeing more spotted wing drosophila in the inner part of the canopy. So we think they prefer that fruit in the inner part of the canopy. So there might be something we can do managing the canopy to try to make that less attractive and reduce those populations. So the last thing I want to talk about a little bit is biological controls in terms of predators and parasitoids for spotted wing drosophila. Right now, there are some native wasp parasitoids that will attack the pupae. So they lay their egg inside the pupae of the spotted wing drosophila, and then their larvae eat that fly. And there's also some native predators, minute pirate bugs, that'll go out there and eat pupae and larvae. Unfortunately, right now, they're not really managing these populations down below economic status. But we're also looking at some parasitoids from their native range in Southeast Asia. And we have some in quarantine that look pr promising. So maybe in a couple of years, we'll have some parasitoids that can be released. So one last thing. What is the economic threshold for spotted wing drosophila? How many spotted wing drosophila are market detectable? We're not really sure. And that's something I'm sure you can think about within your own farm, and it's not something I can tell you. Um, but perhaps you suspect some spotted wing drosophila might be sneaking through your production system. What are some post-harvest management strategies that you might be able to use? Again, coming from Hannah Barak's lab in North Carolina, they've been looking at if you were to put your fruit in a commercial cooler, what would happen? So they kept their fruit at 35 degrees for 72 hours. And this is 35 degrees Fahrenheit. So it just cooled down that fruit after it was harvested. And they had different stages of spotted wing drosophila in the fruit. Looking at that, many of the eggs died after being held at, held at 35 degrees Fahrenheit for 72 hours. Some of the later larvae also died. Um, so you had fewer, fewer later instars. And that's for uh, raspberries. If you looked at it for blueberries, Again, you really saw quite a few of the eggs died, so they didn't hatch at all. And then you had some of the later instars would die if you held them in, in the cold temperatures. But not as many of the middle instars. But more interestingly, if you look at the blueberries, so kept keeping them at room temperature around 68 degrees Fahrenheit, then you look at them at 35 degrees Fahrenheit, took them three days longer to develop into adults. So what that means is if you put them in a cold room, they're not getting worse. They're not developing any further than what they were. And perhaps some of them are dying, depending on what life stage you had. So keeping them, I recommend that you consider keeping your fruit cool after you harvest um, and encourage your consumers to keep their fruit cool. This also helps with some of the, fun, the post-harvest fungi and things like that. So it's always a good thing to refrigerate your fruit. Now I'll transition into talking about some scare, scarab beetles that we have problems with and blueberries and brambles. Here's three different adult scarab beetles that you might have seen in your field. This is the oriental beetle. That was a decent sized beetle, a little over half inch long, coppery color kind of mottled. This is the Japanese beetle. I'm sure you guys have seen this one. It's got a metallic head, a metallic green thorax, 
And then it has these copper colored wings and sometimes you can see the little white tufts of hair along the side. And here's the green June beetle. It's metallic green with little copper edges. This guy is big, it's like an inch long. You can feel it flying by your head when these guys go by. Um, the oriental beetle, you really don't have to worry about in terms of uh, as an adult. They don't feed as adults. So these guys are not feeding on your foliage at all. But what you do see is you see Japanese beetles feeding on the leaves and on the fruit and blueberries. So you see these lacy leaf patterns. You'll see the beetles as well. That's what uh, Japanese beetle looks like in blueberries. And they can feed on the fruit as well. In brambles, you typically will see Japanese beetles feeding on the foliage and also sometimes on the fruit. But you also see green June beetles feeding on the fruit more often in brambles. In terms of the larvae of the scarab beetles, the oriental beetle, the Japanese beetle, and the green June beetle, all are white grubs. So they feed on the roots of plants, and you can find them below your plants. They do not typically reach economically damaging levels unless you have a young blueberry planting. This is where you're most likely to need to control white grubs. Um, so it may cause damage to young blueberry plants from feeding on the roots. So if you have some blueberry plants and you can't really identify why they're not growing too well and they're young, it might be worth taking some samples and seeing if you can find any of these larvae in the soil. In terms of the Japanese beetle life cycle, so these are all kind of grouped under the term June beetles because they all emerge in mid-June. They lay their eggs in July in moist soil. So they really like moist, high organic soils. The larvae will hatch in the late summer. So like in late summer, they start to feed on the roots. They move further down into the soil to overwinter as larvae over the winter time. Come back up, feed a little bit more, but not much in the spring, pupate, and then they emerge as adults. So in terms of when you're most likely to see adult June beetles, this is from mid-June through August. These beetles are actually pretty long-lived. They can live for over 30 days. So you, they kind of stick around after they've emerged. And they typically emerge over time also. So you'll see them for kind of a broad window. They don't just have one flight that emerges. <coughs> and as I mentioned, the larvae hatch in late summer. So when you typically would see white grub damage is from September through October. So that's when your, your young blueberry plantings would be most at risk from white grub damage. In terms of different management strategies for white grubs, and there's some chemical controls. Some of these compounds are the same as the compounds you might use for spotted wing drosophila, um, carbamates, organophosphates, pyrethroids. The neonics, actually, the foliar neonics actually will work for adult Japanese beetles. These do not work very well for spotted wing drosophila. But if you're just trying to manage Japanese beetle, that was, that's an option. Um, and then the diamides. In terms of products that we consider give good control for adult Japanese beetles, Seven, Danitol, and Provado. So those are the three different insecticide groups. Those are some of the better ones. You'll also see moderate control with Lanate, Imidan, Asana, Asail, and Octara. If you are growing organic, um, you, the pyrethrins work a little bit, pyganic. Azadiractin products, such as Azadirect, but there's other products, are your other option, and they tend to work a little bit better than the pyrethrins for the adult Japanese beetle. They'll provide some control, uh, but they're not as effective as you might hope. In terms of if you're worried about white grubs and young blueberries, Admire is the only product that really works on white grubs. In terms of cultural controls, there are some varieties that are more attractive to Japanese beetles than others, particularly blue crop blueberries and heritage red raspberries are quite attractive. They'll feed on any variety. So if you don't have these in your field, you'll still have Japanese beetle damage, but they're gonna go to these ones first. So it's a good place to look for them. Uh, if you are growing these varieties, because they'll go there first. Some of the other things that can make your farm attractive to Japanese beetles, they really like moist organic soil. They're a pest, white grubs are a pest in turf. They're attracted to these green grassy row middles that we plant all around our field. Um, and I know that there's great reasons to have that grass there, but this is some, one of the things that pulls them into your, into your farm. Other things that are really attractive to Japanese beetles, 
Virginia creeper, wild grape, and sassafras. We'll bring them in, and then they tend to build up localized populations near these types of plants. Another thing that's attractive to Japanese beetles are Japanese beetle traps. They pull them in over a distance. Do not put a Japanese beetle trap on your farm. Put it, put it on your neighbor's farm. Yes, no, no, just don't use the Japanese beetle trap. You tend to see increased damage to your plantings near that Japanese beetle tra trap. And again, they pull them in, and they don't necessarily catch them all. Um, so we don't recommend using these traps. Sanitation can help, especially for the green June beetle. If you can remove and destroy your cold fruit, the green June beetle is actually pulled into your field by overripe fruit at first, and then it'll start feeding on ripe fruit. So if you can get that overripe fruit out of there, that helps a lot. Another thing you can do, and some people will do this, is you can actually remove the beetles themselves. So in the early morning and uh, the evening, they're not quite as active. Go out with a bucket of soapy water and knock them off your plants. In terms of exclusion, those of you that are using bird netting to try to protect your fruit, if you use a little bit finer bird netting, it's not as fine as something that would exclude spotted Drosophila, but just a little bit finer, you can exclude the Japanese beetle. So here you can see them all on the outside of that netting in a grape vineyard. In terms of predators and parasitoids, there's a lot of animals that'll feed on Japanese beetles, uh, grackles, starlings, shrews, and moles. Uh, Typically, they're not going to control them to a point where they're not causing damage in your field. Just be aware there are some people out there helping you. Um, there are some insects that feed on them, robber flies, wheel bugs. They're out there feeding on the Japanese beetles as well. What you really want to keep an eye out for are the winsome fly eggs. So if you see these white eggs on the back of the Japanese beetle, that Japanese beetle has been parasitized. Leave that Japanese beetle in your field. It's a good thing. Uh, so this fly lays its eggs. They'll hatch into larvae and burrow in and kill that, kill that beetle. <laughs> um, you can buy parasitic nematodes, and we recommend this. I know some of you have heard of milky spore powder. We, if you're gonna, instead of milky spore powder, actually we recommend parasitic nematodes are a little bit better. They have some of the same problems as milky spore powder. It's a really short shelf life. You have to be careful where you buy it from. You have to get good quality product. I have no idea what the quality of this product is. It's just a product you can find on the internet. Um, so, and you have to follow the directions, yes. Do they have sell-by dates so you know whether you're getting the old product or not? not? Not all of them. They're not as highly regulated as the insecticides. Um, so that's one of the problems. You want to have a reputable source of them. Just buying it off Amazon probably isn't going to work for you. You mentioned the but those are terrible for bees and pollinators. So do you would recommend those? If, if you follow the label and the pollinators aren't active in your field, the neonicotinoids are still a good product and they are more specific than some of the other insecticides. I mean, the carbamates are very broad spectrum and bad for bees as well. They just don't have quite the same reputation as the neonics. Um, in terms of where I'd use the nematodes, the species you want are Steinonarma glasseri and Heterodivus bacteriophora. If you look at this, that's the two that were in this particular product. Um, there's another species, Carplocapsi, that you usually see. It's not quite as good for grubs. It do, it doesn't, grubs don't move around in the soil that much. So that species isn't going to get them. Um, and the nematodes actually are better at killing the beetles if you irrigate during treatment. So the nematodes need that moist soil so they can move through it. And this could potentially be something you apply on your grassy areas in your field. So in Mi Michigan, Rufus Isaacs was looking at trying to manage the grassy row middles as something to control Japanese beetle populations on the farm in blueberries. And he used Admire, uh, a neonicotinoid insecticide, to kill the grubs for this. What he found was that it would delay how soon you saw Japanese beetles for a couple of weeks. So you still got Japanese beetles moving in from other areas, but it happened a couple weeks later because they weren't coming right out of your farm. Question. I have a question, because uh, many of us in here grow berries, and if, uh, like myself, your part of your farm is wooded. Do you recommend when you're applying the insecticide for the uh, insects that you apply it to the wild blueberry, uh, wild blackberries and raspberries that come up in the woods? Are they going to transmit this insect? 
<coughs> you cannot legally apply insecticides to the wild areas. So I cannot recommend that, no. Um, and they're still gonna move in from your neighbor's wooded areas as well. Question? On the first rate nematodes, at what, what stage do they, do they work on? Or do you Only on the grubs. On the grubs, I mean, uh -huh. you can apply them before emergence, or is there a certain time about the before You'd want to apply, so, point, so, so the question was when you would want to apply the nematodes. You would want to apply the nematodes when the grubs are most active. So this is gonna be in the fall, the September, October period, targeting where you see the grubs, so targeting the grassy row middles. Um, and then you would see in the next season that your beetle population starts a little bit later. So the last few. Yes. Because so in the spring, if they're still overwintering, they're gonna be low in the soil, so the nematodes aren't gonna get down there. So you want them while they're up there actively feeding where the nematodes can get to them. The last thing to mention about Japanese beetles is they are good flyers, so they keep coming in from surrounding areas. There's only so much you can do about the habitat you have on your farm because they're gonna keep coming in from the woods, they're gonna keep coming in from your neighbors, they're gonna keep coming in from the cow pasture down the road. So that's something to keep in mind. And we also tend to have high populations in some years and then lower populations in others, and this kind of moves around the state. So this isn't something that's regularly a big problem. I saw a lot of them last year, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to bring them up this year. Um, and we don't know what the population is gonna be like this year. Any more questions? Uh, back to the spot of mine. Uh, how, you said it only kick, or, we're spraying for the adults. So you got the larvae in there. How long before the larvae that are already laid are gonna come out and need to kill them? Depending on how long they've been infested. So the question was, how long does it take for the spot when you're soft to develop? In warm weather, it takes them about 10 days to go from an egg to an adult. So the larvae, it doesn't take very many days before they become an adult again if you already have larvae in there. Um, yeah. Other questions? One, yes. You, look, you looked at the uh, grubs as uh, going to the beetles and then creating problems in your, in your garden or what have you. How about the other side? If you've got the grubs that have got a problem with molds, what do you recommend we do about molds? You <laughs> got a problem with the molds. You know I'm an insect person. I don't really think about how to manage the moles. <laughs> but maybe they're eating some of your beetles? <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for Kelly? Okay, very good.